Okay, so this is the 29th lecture out of 41 lectures on the creation of an international sustainable civilization. And this one uh, continues the sections on being a prophet and what the iconic figures in Indonesia's Panchasila number one. It has, re it has uh, religious pluralism. So we were on Confucianism and the pre previous lecture showed that Confucius had the same virtues that Aristotle talks about. So the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, I argue, are compatible with Aristotle's virtues. So then we can learn a lot about how having those virtues promotes democracy, because that was the issue in Greece. Um, but this one, this second lecture, is about how political leaders have used Confucius it, with, for their own political purposes. And I'm giving two examples, two extreme examples. And they're just two examples. You can imagine, easily imagine, how any political leader could use Confucius Analects as part of their political agenda and end up with very different agendas. Um, so understanding these virtues is not going to solve all our problems. There's the other, I mean, Aristotle would say that virtue is not a logos. It's not a set of definitions. It's an ergon. It's a way of life. How do you apply those virtues? How do you make you, you need to be a virtuous person. You need to be intellectually aware. You need to all know all this stuff or know what experts to bring in to make a decision. And then in the art of deliberation, you figure out your options. You argue about which one's best. You make sure you include all the real options, but you don't include impossibilities. And then you figure out what you think is best to maximize human flourishing. Then you understand why. Then you manage to persuade the people who need to change to achieve these goals so that you actually will achieve the goal. And of course, that's complicated. But the United Nations has that model. The goal is human flourishing all over the world now and in the future. Um, so the first section of this lecture is about US founding fathers. So they founded a democracy. They wanted a free society and the, our Declaration of Independence focuses on individualism and the John Locke, the author of this ideology um, was also focused on um, materialism. So if you want to, they lived in Europe and he lived in England and there was the political philosophy was the divine right of kings. So the king was told people were told that the king was related to Adam. And so the king spoke for God in some, to some degree. Well, of course, in Europe, there had been all these wars between the Pope who spoke for God and the kings who spoke for God. And then there were these Protestants who thought that they were speaking for God. And so you had all these wars. So our founders wanted to get God out of there. Okay, so there's no official state religion. Um, but you, they were tolerant. I mean, they brought in people from all sorts of Christian denominations. So the vast majority of them were still Christian, but they were from different denominations. And so the key there was not to let the Calvinists go to war with the Church of England or with the Methodists with the Baptists, I mean, keep those uh, groups together as citizens. So the key to that was 
They understood that most moral education and training traditionally has occurred at the church because that's where you have the seven deadly sins and that's where people are supposed to repent and they're supposed to live by grace and by grace means virtue and all that stuff. Trouble is that can lead to intolerance. You know, my denomination is the only one that has God's true grace, right? So we already went through that, that every prophet points out the corruption in the religious leaders and the religious institutions. So our founders are very aware of the corruption of religious institutions. They're also very aware of the corruption of political leaders. And they're aware of the corruption of when they get put together and the religious leaders have political power or the political leaders claim to have religious power, then you're in trouble. So how do you educate people for virtue, to have Aristotle's virtues without thinking you have to go to this church to get them, right? They want people to think they are natural virtues and they are part of our nature as human beings that we can come together and exercise citizenship consciousness, that we can develop practical wisdom and take care of our practical problems, of our collective, practical, down-to-earth problems, how to set, how to build roads, how to figure out how to protect ourselves from external enemies, set up a military, set up a police, but also set up um, markets, set up educational systems, set up. How do we do that? Because we don't want it tied to religion and we don't want it um, tied to, we don't want a, a powerful political leader that mandates all this. People have to take turns ruling and being ruled. They have to be elected. But in order to know what to do once you get elected, you have to have practical wisdom. How do you get it? So they liked Confucius Analects. And if you think about it, it makes sense that they would like Confucius Analects. They would want every American to know the Analects because the Analects promote those virtues without asking people to believe in Confucius, you know, that's not, they would know right away intuitively, these are natural values. These should be the foundation of our democracy. And then people could figure out, well, they're a lot like what I learned in church, except, you know, somebody who goes to a different church can have these same virtues. Or perhaps they're a lot like what my rulers are saying, but... <laughs> It's better if citizens can rule themselves and they don't depend on a ruler to say it because a ruler can hide behind the language of virtue. We need to actually cultivate these virtues and know, and we know each other are virtuous because we're actually working with each other. We're living with each other. We have the air gun, the way of life, of virtue. We know that because we know the people then we won't be manipulated by the language of virtue or the language of religion. So the founders wanted a political revolution, but a moral revolution. So they wanted to reject the corruption of the British elite. And at that time, the, the elite uh, would use Aristotle. Aristotle was one of the languages that they would use to justify maintaining their power and privilege. Our founders didn't want that. The language of rights, I have a right to life, liberty, pursuing happiness, however I want to. That was political language, but you, you have to have an enlightened view of happiness if you're going to maintain a democracy. So how do you get that enlightened view of happiness? <laughs> Just uh, the author of The Hacking of the American Mind said that Americans now have totally confused uh, happiness. They've made it into pleasure instead of contentment. And Aristotle 
You know, they've corrupted Aristotle, Bentham corrupted Aristotle. So he understands. Um, the author of The Hacking of American Mind understands Aristotle's virtue, theory of virtues was good. We ought to go back to it. And so, again, we keep going back to it. So, all right. Um, but our founders didn't want to go back to Aristotle as such, because that would trigger what those corrupt elites in Britain were saying to justify uh, the, the continual entrenchment of power and privilege among the elite. So some of our founders, these are some of the major American founders. Thomas Paine, quote, listed Confucius in the same category as Jesus and Socrates, which is what I do in my lectures. A manual for public devotion he created omitted any biblical passage, passages, but included Confucius. Okay, why? Because the Bible was a source of animosity among citizens from different denominations. It was being used as a weapon to polarize people. It was then and now, right? Religious texts are abused today. We need to point that out to avoid it, right? Not let our students or political leaders do this. They should stop doing this. No matter what tradition you're from, right? Uh, you could use the Quran that way. You could use the Old Testament. Um, uh, even Modi uses the Hindu Vedas that way. This is always wrong. And our founders looked to Confucius Analects as a way out. So James Madison was the father, he's considered the father, father of the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. He had a portrait of Confucius hanging in his home. He wanted to keep that intuition going of the way Confucius described virtuous person and a virtuous leader. Benjamin Franklin published excerpts in his newspaper saying Confucius proposed to the princes to first polish their own character and reason and then the reason of their subjects. Franklin wanted to start a united party for virtue to form the virtuous and good men of all nations into a regular body to be governed by suitable good and wise rulers, which good and wise men may, may be unanimous in their obedience to, right? Constantly reminding yourself, what is a good leader? And Franklin, because he was a prominent citizen, a leader in his country, he wanted to constantly keep Confucius intellects in mind. Confucius' mode of teaching he says, has a wonderful influence on humankind. Thomas Paine said, as a book of morals, there are several parts of the New Testament that are good. And I'm going to quote the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm sure he would include that. But they are no other than what has been preached in the East several hundred years before Christ was born. He means the Analects. Thomas Jefferson's inaugural address, he said, let us pursue our own federal and Republican principles. In other words, we want a constitutional government, our attachment to union and representative government, enlightened by a benign religion, professed in deed and practiced in various forms, yet all of them inculcating honesty, truth, temperance, gratitude, and love of men, acknowledging and adoring and overruling providence. Jefferson considered Confucius Analects to represent this type of global religion. So I will also say that Capra and Luigi, their model of systems thinking is also these same virtues, and the same organic point of view and the same respect for being a microcosm in the macrocosm. These are foundational. Okay, then, and then my next move. So that's the first one. The founders thought of Confucius Analects as a really nice counterpart 
or a really nice addition to the culture they were trying to develop because it would give you a model of the virtuous person and the virtuous ruler. But for them, of course, they'd have to, you have to take turns ruling and being ruled. Where in Confucius, there just is one ruler. Um, it's just that he rules for the benefit of the ruled. So what they liked about the book was it was natural virtues. They wouldn't have liked the fact that the ruler is not elected and he doesn't, he'd have limited terms also. So Americans were ha going to have to internalize those virtues within the context of a Republican gover government with the rule, rule of law and the replacement of a pre even a president, the executive, every eight years. So, um, so that would be the caveat they would have. Now, China. What's going on in China in the last, what, 15 years? And of course, this is changing rapidly. Um, so I think um, this was written right around the time that Xi Jinping was elected, actually. He just went for his third term. So, okay. It was before Xi Jinping. Um, and so what did they say? So uh, one of the main uh, professor at uh, in Geneva, but someone who was obviously from China and expert in China, what he wanted to say is this is what China is good at that America is not good at. So he's very good at poking at our weaknesses, I think. And that's a good thing. Somebody needs to call us out for our weaknesses so we can get better. So it's good, you know, we tend to be ignorant. Everyone ignores their weaknesses or if they're pointed out, they tend to deny or um, get angry, fight back. But he's just digging, you know, he's telling us who we are. He says, we seek truth from facts as opposed to you, you have this ideology in principle, you should not, there shouldn't be government interference in the economy. You know, the Chinese say, well, sure there should, if it helps build the middle class. So, and they and they have facts, like the people who work for Mr. Xi have experience, they're experienced political leaders, uh, not just hacks, like the people who work for Trump, have no political experience. He had no political experience. So um, this was before Trump was elected, but we do tend to elect people who have no experience. Now, the Chinese would not do that. They have their own problems with corruption, but not that. <laughs> okay, the primacy of the people's livelihood. So China has a reputation for being able to lift up the poor and get them into the middle class. Well, America, more and more, ever since uh, the 1980s, Ronald Reagan, has been shrinking its middle class. And so our reputation is to be a wealthy country with no middle class or with a much, much smaller middle class than we should have. Because basically we're an oligarchy there's a very small percentage of our people in our country are billionaires who basically run everything. And so when the Chinese say, look, we put the primacy of the people first, your politicians might say they do that. They put freedom first and they mean by freedom, freedom for the rich to get richer. It's gotten corrupted into that. And so he can point out, hey guys, look at the facts. We got people into the middle class. We are whole, he says, Chinese people think holistically and they think long-term. So this is Aristotelian. But again, this is not the way we're operating in the US because so many CEOs, people in business who basically pay for our political campaigns, they're accountable for whether you made a profit in the last quarter, which means three months. And they make, this is not good. 
that we don't have big picture thinking. We the, we might get an administration in, they have this huge plan. The next 10 years, we're gonna do this. Well, four years later, uh, the opposite administration comes in and they throw out all of those plans. They have totally different plans that contradict those plans. So we don't have a plan and this is a serious problem. He says, Chinese think of government as a necessary virtue. Well, so do Indonesians also. Panchasila number five, government provides education, healthcare, infrastructure. It's necessary and it's good. Whereas America is the most notorious for, all, for minimal government. You don't have the government do it unless you absolutely have to. And so what happens is, you wait for the situations to get so horrible that the government has to come in and try to fix it. But by then it's so bad, the government has trouble fixing it and is not given enough money to fix it. And so then the government looks bad and then people hate government. Um, so in America, we don't have a good enough educational system. Our healthcare system is too connected to private profit. Um, we have a lot of problems with that. And the Chinese just says, we don't even think that way. <laughs> Good governance matters more than democratization. This is a, a big issue. This is an issue that people in the developing countries have to ponder when they decide who they want to do their economic contracts with, who they want to allow to come in and, and build infrastructure, who they want to get loans from. Do they want to get them from China or do they want to get them from the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, or there's another development bank that is um, funded by BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, um, India, China, um, South Africa, and now there's a number of other countries that have joined. So um, so this is you know a big debate all over the world at this point. Does it matter more that you develop your people, even if it's more authoritarian? You must do this, you can't do that. You can't, children cannot go onto social media. There's many, many sites that are blocked, you know, both for better and worse, you know, it's tricky. And, um, but in China, there's no question. Lifting up the middle class or claiming to lift them up matters more than democracy and they will behave in authoritarian ways to achieve that goal. On the other hand, in the US, freedom is freedom to teach your kid not to like science, to teach your kid that God ordained that Christopher Columbus discover America because Europeans were destined by God to conquer the frontier, to overthrow the Native Americans, to bring in slaves. You know, there are history books in the US that tell all these incredible lies, but that's okay. You're free to educate your child any way you want. So we have a lot of faction, obviously, in our country because we can't agree on much of anything, but hey, we're free. Okay. <laughs> um, free to vote for somebody who is going to cheat you out of a decent life, who's going to destroy a minimum wage, who's going to make destroy the unions and make your life more difficult, but it's free, you know, they're free to do what they want. You're free to take the job or not. And you are free to elect whoever you. Performance matters. Rules have to be competent. Rulers have to be competent, experienced and trained. So the idea there is that you are held accountable this does not happen in our country often enough, or it's too often that it doesn't happen because 
the people in charge are the friends of the people who hired them. Uh, but that, the, that can also happen in China. It's just that in the U.S., it becomes pretty obvious. The CEO, his the company can go bankrupt, and yet they have what's called a golden parachute. They get $30 million or something, and they leave. So that the author of this article sort of knows how to pit America versus China. And to me, it's just an opportunity for thinking critically and getting better. But, you know, that something for my students, people listening to this to think about. Here's more, uh, eight more ideas. Selective learning and adaptation. Learning from others is prized. Adapting to new challenges. And I do think the Chinese are adapting in a, many aspects of uh, culture and the economy in the U.S. is from a previous era, from the fossil fuel era, from uh, traditions that really are dysfunctional at this point. And it's very ironic because America was the progressive country when it was formed. And now, I mean, we were the ones that could, especially science, because we didn't have religion fighting against science. So we could develop science, technology. People came to America to get, one reason was to get rich. The other reason was religious freedom. And so that's why we developed technology, but that's also why we have more climate deniers, people who hate science because they were allowed to come to America and believe whatever they want, as long as you don't bring it in the public arena. And now these people are, are influencing the educational system, which I think is a big mistake. But anyway, so um, China has a reputation for being more adaptive, looking forward to the future, because they feel like the future belongs to them. And the U.S. is crashing and burning and living in the past. Um, the Chinese look for harmony in diversity versus the Western style. Politics is ad adversarial. Everybody has is arguing about their rights or whatever. Um, and then he says, while well, China will continue to learn from the West for its own benefit, the West could also learn from China for its benefit. I think we should do that. We should avoid ideologically driven animosity, enrich the world's collective wisdom and tackling challenges like climate change, poverty, and the clash of civilizations. So Indonesia, again, should step up, present its Panchasila as not ideologically driven. It's pluralistic and humanistic. And both of those are anti-ideology. And also Panchasila number four is wisdom through deliberation. So that is the, the ancient model. And it's the, it's the Chinese model also. Okay, so that's things to think about. And then there's articles about Mr. Xi. And this, I think, is interesting. This was during his second five-year term. Um, there is a book on that written by Xi Jinping thought. There's a he has a ideology on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Okay, this is going to be the preamble of China's constitution. So the Chinese are presenting themselves as um, new, right? They're imitating the U.S. in the sense that the U.S. in its day had a whole new constitution based on new principles, rights, nature's God, no king, constitutional government, right? So now she is countering that and he's presenting China as um, new thought, right? So he's a new kind of thinking that's going to fit with this, this seventh stage in globalization. They're going to adapt to the new 
wave of globalization, which is especially green energy. Um, the other thing, I was in China in 2012, and the people used to talk about the old Mao and the new Mao. And so they talked about Mao at first when he was very Marxist and he was very dedicated to his country. But then the new Mao got entrenched in maintaining his power and he got corrupt. That was sort of the standard thing. And then um, the next leader, oh, I can't remember his name, but the leader at that time was uh, the one that allowed in capitalism. And so he wrote about his big thing was socialism with a Chinese character meant you let in the private sector, but you regulate it with the government way more than it's regulated in the US. Well, now Mr. Xi is coming up with his ideology um, and it's going to be a pre preamble to the constitution, just like Panchasila is a preamble to Indonesia's. So she vows a great rejuvenation. I think this is great because he's imitating Confucius to restore China to its ancient prominence and glory. So you remember Confucius arose during the, the time of the warring states and he invented deliberate tradition. He invented the story of the good old days in the golden age of China. And this is a real Chinese person, right? And so she is both looking forward right? Socialism with Chinese characteristics means that we are going to adapt to the next wave of globalization because the Americans are stuck in fossil fuels and in capitalism, and it's just making the rich richer. It's dysfunctional. So we're going to come up with the next paradigm. But he's also imitating the golden era of China. So he's saying Chinese people have the technological capacity. Chinese people are great, right? Because there was a time when China had a huge chunk of the world economy because they sold products the British, the Westerners wanted, which was silk, tea, and porcelain, especially. Um, he started, Mr. Xi started the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which again is brilliant because he'll he's getting connected to the rest of the world. He's helping them build their um, bridges and their train tracks, infrastructure. We can't even fix the infrastructure in our own country. And if I sound like I'm down on my country, I love my country, but we're throwing away everything great about it. And just like Socrates, you know, I want us to be self-critical. The more self-critical we are, the more we can learn and grow and get beyond where we are. We don't want to think about the past. We want to think about the future because we were based on thinking about the future. That was where our success was. Um, anyway, so he's, um, setting up these Belt and Road infrastructure, plus he's, he's, uh, financing all sorts of innovation in green products. So then if they develop green products first, they can send them down to Africa, to Southeast Asia, all over the world on their train tracks. Now, um, I also know that how how do the people in Africa and whatever deal with this? Um, first of all, the presidents allow them to come in and do it. You, it provides jobs, but it doesn't. Uh, I think most of them Chinese people come and do the work, and it's not necessarily the highest quality work, is what I've heard but it still provides jobs. There's, you know, they have to build housing and food and all that. So it is economic development. And then it's a kind of permanent development. 
Um, so, so then the other issue is what sort of loans does China give to these African countries? Does it really improve their economic development? Does it, is it help their people flourish? And I think Americans really need to look carefully and think hard about if you were a good African leader, what is China offering you in terms of your country's development and your people's flourishing? And what is the West offering? International Monetary Fund, World Bank, or American loans or whatever. And uh, I don't, I'm not, I can't do all the data, but that would be the question. And I know that there's some cases clearly where Africans are better off. Now, there's the other issue of human rights. Uh, China is not going to criticize the African countries if they violate human rights. Probably not. But on the other hand, we might, you know, yell and shout about that. But still, our country, we, the only people who have rights are the billionaires. You don't have a right to a job or a middle class life or education or health care. I mean, those are very minimal. So we have a lot of people in our country that don't have a decent standard of living. So it's a complicated question is my main thing. And um, he, and now she is centralizing power, is increasing the party control of business, news, internet, cultural, culture, and education. He just got elected to his third term, which the old constitution only allowed for two terms. So, um, of course, the US is going to get all hot and bothered about that because our politicians have to claim to really be afraid of it. To some extent, it should be threatening, but um, it's not. War is not the answer to this, right? Declaring war on China or getting into a military uh, saber rattling is a really stupid way to address it because the real problem is economic. So the way to address it is to educate our students in STEM, to have a flourishing society with a lot of innovation and in STEM product so we can compete with them. Okay, that's the real war or that's the real competition. And whoever wins that one takes over the international economic, you know, the global economic system. And, you know, that's, bigger than war, military control. Um, so what, oh, the latest thing is obviously that the Chinese are creating electronic vehicles at half the price, a third of the price of Europe or the US because we fell behind. We could have had that market, but we chose not to. We let our fossil fuel companies control our economy. So now China is stepping in. Well, then the latest thing that Mr. Trump says, we already have a 30% tariff. So the cars already cost a lot. He's going to put a 100% tariff on everything. Well, Larry Summers says it's a terrible idea. Uh, we'll see what happens. But tariffs and wars are not the solution. Educating our students in STEM and green innovation and Bill Gates approach is the way to go, I think. Um, and I would, you know, like to know who, you know, what sort of answer to that there is. I think most of the reasons people wouldn't agree with me is they wouldn't have thought of it because they don't think that way. But anyway, in propaganda, Mr. Xi is referred to using a word, a reverent Chinese word for a leader that was also used for Mao, probably also for Confucius. He's portrayed as a visionary leader on a historic mission. He also links his vision to older Chinese traditions, 
especially Confucianism. And so he regularly quotes Confucius and other ancient sages, stressing their teachings on obedience and order, promoting the idea the party is the custodian of a 5,000-year-old civilization. He's a Confucian patriarch that runs the country as if it were his own family. So, the, I mean, the thing that's interesting here is that our founders liked Confucius and our founders leaders would have this image of the Confucius leader in their mind as they lead, but they're also leading the world's most free and open society, the society with constitutional government, the society that rejected any single leader. So now the same texts are being used by Xi to justify and reinforce the, the most powerful authoritarian leader in the world in terms of how many people he has power over and how much power. And so the same texts. So then what's the essence of those texts that you could possibly use them for both of these extremes? Well, it's rule for the benefit of the ruled. So that would go back to Aristotle, right? Aristotle would say, having a centralized government isn't necessarily bad if it's rule for the benefit of the ruled. And, but he would favor a constitutional government. It's the best thing is always to educate your citizens to rule and be ruled in turn. The best government has some elected officials and some appointed. But um, the Mr. Xi might be just, but the issue there, he always says, Aristotle, that it's much easier to become corrupt if you have centralized power, because you're not going to have transparency and accountability. Whereas if you have taking turns, ruling and being ruled, if you have transparency and accountability built into your culture, which Athens had, you're much more likely to have politicians that actually are just. Um, the other problem is, who's going to come after Mr. Xi? So Aristotle says in a monarchy, the children often, even if the rulers are very good, they, they were never home to raise their children. Their children, you know, can be entirely different. And that happened in Rome, you know. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was considered a philosophical leader, but his son was horrible. <laughs> and so the empire depends upon this inherited power, and that is not a good idea. And Aristotle says that. So this is, I think this is a lesson learned about, I'm going to teach you these iconic figures. I'm going to teach you the texts. I'm going to show you that they have these virtues. But I'm also going to remind you and show you that these texts and these models have been used in the West. They were used to justify an entrenched privilege class. And that was our enlightenment overthrew that. It, over, it rejected Aristotle also at the same time. In China, the, the emperor used Confucius, but in the communist revolution, they threw out the emperor and they threw out Confucius <laughs> because they associated with the emperor. So she is bringing it back, right? But in this new form, um, he allows capitalist development, but it's regulated capitalism. So now both countries have a form of regulated capitalism. The political system does have laws to control the economic system. And I would say, as a generalization, perhaps China has too much control, perhaps, I don't know enough. And, and America, it seems to me, has too little governing control over the economic system. The billionaires have gotten out of control. Um, so, it's best not to think in ideological absolutist concept ways, conceptual ways. 
it's best to look at the particulars, which is right back to Aristotle. His actual theory says that. Even though the aristocrats that used it to justify their um, unjustifiable inheritance of power, even though they abused it like that, that isn't what he said at all. <laughs> he said, when people inherit privilege without earning it or showing they really knew what to do with it, they become corrupt and arrogant, which is exactly what happened in Europe. But that also could happen or could be happening in China, that Mr. Xi starts just appointing his friends because he's ruled long enough so that he has enemies and friends and he has to keep appointing his friends. Well, maybe his friends aren't necessarily that good at what they're assigned to do, but because of their loyalty. You don't know, okay? It happens in the West. It's the same issues. How do we get cut through all the rhetoric and all the false stuff and figure out how do we get to the essence so that we can actually have flourishing societies? All right, so then there's an article that Mr. Xi is, there's, there's a drive toward authoritarian leaders around the world right now. So it's not just Mr. Xi, it's, you know, Turkey and Hungary and all these others. So um, the Communist Party in, oh geez, what year? It announced that Mr. Xi could be, could hold the power for life. So it's now much more authoritarian. But there's other leaders who also now have absolute power that didn't at, a, at earlier. Putin in Russia, Sisi in Egypt, Erdogan in Turkey, and in Hungary, Orban in Hungary and Poland. So this is happening all over the world. Um, people, Some people worry that Mr. Trump will do that if he gets elected in a few months, but we shall see. Um, the faith in liberal democracies and market economies is questioned as a way to promote prosperity because the rich in market economies, especially the U.S., have just walked away with the whole political system and economic system, and 80% of the public is struggling. Donald Trump admires these leaders, and he visits them. And members of the Republican Party are sending this message to Americans that if you elect us in 2024, we will do that. We will take over the way Putin and his uh, loyalists do and the way she does in the way. Okay. Um, I don't know how many Americans believe it or even know. What can we learn from studying ancient wisdom? We can become clear in our minds. There's a universal set of values or a way of life that's described in many of the world's moral leaders from long ago until today. This way of life is based on the human condition. It takes on different forms in a cultural context. It adapts to each generation. It can be corrupted easily because leaders can describe the virtues in ways that convince the public, but be centralized, centralizing their power or giving power to their friends and family behind the rhetoric. Sometimes centralized power does benefit the people. Other times it does not. These traditions can also be used as weapons to create animosity with other nations or other traditions within a nation, even with that's not the way the moral icons lived. The people who basically started the religion, whether they intended to or not, it's not the way they lived and it's not what they taught. So, you know, I hope you can learn that. Um, I think when I usually talk to students, before we even read all these materials, they can recognize those patterns. And that's why I like talking to college students. They've been ripped away from home, put in a different environment. They can't just live by habit and tradition. They find out other people's narratives and their worldviews are different. 
And then the class is to help them understand they appear to be different, but there really are similarities. And so then they can spend their college years thinking about similarities and differences, foundational perennial values, way of life that keeps emerging as the best and the mistakes. And then they can figure out what they want to do. They can be creative. They'll have to be creative the rest of their lives, creating their life. And they create a worldview to, to justify their life or to provide vision for where they want to go next in their life. So that's the process. And I hope that people listening to this set of lectures will pick up and do that with their life and their teaching.